My name is Rachel Stringfellow, a, pro a policy officer at Preston City Council, where I work on community wealth building and promoting the Preston model. With these webinars, we want to share understanding of how a co cooperative model of doing business can thrive in the digital age and shape a new economy which combines dignity, equality and community. After more than a year of COVID and with the climate emergency intensifying, it is evident more than ever that only an economy built on these foundations will have the resilience to navigate the challenges ahead. Cooperatives are a key element of the Preston model and of community wealth building on which the Preston model is based. Cooperatives are democratically run organisations in which members have an equal call on assets and on any surplus. And beyond their own organisation, members are committed to the wider community and to supporting other cooperative businesses. In other words, cooperatives create community wealth. Cooperatives are also an international movement committed to the principles of the International Cooperative Alliance. And their origins lie just down the road, if you're joining us from Lancashire, in Rochdale. So for all these reasons, cooperatives deserve our attention as we seek to build back better from COVID. In today's webinar, we focus on the cooperative ownership of digital platforms and the opportunities this creates for a more diverse and democratic economy. Our speakers today are drawn from the cooperative pioneers of the Northwest and the UK, who are transforming platform capitalism into platform cooperativism. We hope today's event will inspire you to, to explore how a cooperatively owned digital platform might contribute to your own vision for a cooperative economy. Our first speaker today is Vika Rogers from Unfound, Cooperatives UK's programme to facilitate the development of the UK platform cooperative sector. Vika will explain more about what platform cooperatives are and the work Corps UK are doing to support them. After Vika, we'll hear from Jen Smith, co-founder of Signalize, a platform for deaf people to book British Sign Languages interpreters which is owned and controlled by both stakeholder groups. Jen is a signer herself and an IT professional. Our next speaker is Debbie Whitten, co-founder of the newly established Chalton Bike Deliveries Co-op, a bike delivery co-op that uses the Co-op Cycle digital platform and which is now an approved supplier on the NHS's sustainable transport list. I understand that Climate Action Preston is exploring options for a cooperatively run bike project. So a special welcome today to any Climate Action Preston members with us this afternoon. Finally, we'll hear from Lynn Davis, CEO of Open Food Network UK, an open source platform that enables new ethical food supply chains by linking local producers to local consumers. We are particularly excited to hear from Lynn today as the larder in Preston has plans to become a local food hub within the Open Food Network. I am also very pleased to welcome Sam, <laughs> who will be interpreting throughout the session today. Thank you, Sam. Before we start, a couple of bits of housekeeping. Each speaker will talk for about 15 minutes, followed by 10 minutes of questions. So do put your questions in the chat and the speakers will pick those up at the end of their presentation. We're going to record the webinar. We're going to record the webinar today, which will be edited and posted online and we'll let you know when it's available. Finally, please would you put your, turn your cameras off and make sure that your mics are switched off too. So I'd like to pass to our first speaker this afternoon, Vika. From Corps UK. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, and do interrupt me if I go over time, but I should be able to stay within my time. Um, so, welcome everyone. Um, as Rachel mentioned, I work for Cooperatives UK and I run the Unfound program, which is set up specifically to support the development of the platform cooperative sector. Um, I'll just 
start from a brief int introduction of, of platform co-ops uh, and then give you a bit of an overview of the landscape and the, the challenges uh, that uh, we're facing in, in developing this sector and what we're trying to do about it. Um, so first of all, the concept of, of, of platform co-ops and, and the word, let's say, was coined around 2015, uh, in particular by two academics, Trevor Schultz and Nathan Schneider. Trevor is based in New York and, and Nathan Schneider in Boulder, Colorado. And the, the idea really came as a reaction to the gig economy. So it was sort of at the end of the, of the wave in which there was a big, big excitement about the sharing economy and Airbnb and all these platforms that would, you know, would save people from, from their precarious jobs and offer new opportunities uh, of income. Um, and so the, the these two academics really put forward a critique towards the gig economy and the uh, platform capitalism and said, well, what if we thought of platforms cooperatively own and run? What, how, how can we sort of decouple the, the tech from actually the organizations uh, that are behind them? And what impact would it have if we actually looked at who was behind the tech and how we could do that differently? Um, and so if we try to imagine if we try to imagine what an alternative to Deliveroo and Uber would be, um, how would that impact the rights of workers if they were in charge of their platforms? How would it impact how the algorithms worked uh, in determining how they got work and um, uh, yeah, and the patterns of, of working, et cetera? How would uh, Spotify operate if it was owned by musicians or even listeners? Or how would Airbnb operate if it was owned by hosts and maybe the local authority and that they could reinvest um, the, the, the profits from the platform into, their, into the local community? Um, now, what is really exciting is that these platforms already exist as cooperatives. So in the case of uh, Deliveroo, we have, for example, Co-op Cycle, uh, and we'll be hearing about one of the um, Cycle Courier Co-ops that are using this platform. Uh, Spotify, we have Resonate, which is owned and run by musicians and uh, listeners. And we have a uh, emerging platform co-op also called Fair BNB, which is really looking at how uh, hosts like a platform similar to Airbnb, but where hosts would be contributing to, to the local community. Um, so, but platforms aren't only being set up as a reaction to the existing platforms. What is really inspiring is that the cooperative, joining the cooperative model with the platform model, um, we can really design some really, really interesting businesses and interesting platforms. Um, and so we'll be hearing more from Signalize, um, but they're, they're platforms like Signalize, like Equal Care Co-op, where bringing the platform model and the cooperative model together really allows to bridge the gap between those that are providing a service and, and receiving a service. Uh, and allows them to build collaboratively the, both the platform and the cooperative so that it works to benefit, benefit them. Um, we also have a, another type of platform cooperative that I also find very interesting, which is the, where the, the technology really provides an infrastructure for existing businesses. And we'll be hearing more about this through uh, Lynn from Open Food Network, but the technology is, is really there to, to support existing businesses or to support uh, new emergent businesses. And so in some way, Co-op Cycle works in this way. So Co-op Cycle is a platform that allows courier co-ops to um, use the platform to connect, to allow um, delivery, uh, um, to, to use the platform to, to sort of organize their deliveries. And so by sort of pooling resources to build the infrastructure, then this allows small local cooperatives also, also to thrive. Um, and I think that's a really interesting model for, for the cooperative movement. Um, 
However, there are lots of challenges uh, and obviously we're not seeing, you know, loads and loads of platforms emerging and and it takes a long time. So you know, we started talking about them in 2015. So there's still like a long way to go before we see a lot of successful um, cooperatives. Uh, and so I'm just going to go through some of the challenges and some of the things that we're trying to do at Cops UK, but also that we need to be doing collectively to really um, allow this, this uh, movement and this sector to grow. The first one is definitely raising awareness. So thank you for, for setting up this event. It's really important to be able to talk about it, uh, but also through the media, through social media. Uh, and we need to raise awareness both with people that want to set up the business, but also with users. So that we need people to be using these platforms and understanding why they're much more ethical than, than the big platform, um, the big capitalist platforms. Um, there's a big need for, for business support. Um, and that's something that we're, we're obviously trying to address. So at the moment, we have launched an accelerator program specifically for platform cooperatives. Uh, we've just closed the application window for the first edition, uh, but the, a new edition will be running in the autumn, starting from September, and applications will be open from June and July. So do subscribe to our newsletter to be notified about that, and I can put links into, into the, the chat and respond to any questions. We also have a program called The Hive that provides uh, tailored support for anyone wanting to set up a a cooperative in whatever sector it doesn't have to be uh, a platform but um if you if you're ready to set, set up do do get in touch uh, and and find out about that program because it's it can be really tailored to your needs um and then obviously we're we're trying to put as much resources online as possible so visit our website we've got uh, training events and we've got um resources that you can use um then the other big issue is lack of capital. Uh, and this is one of the, the biggest challenges, especially if we're trying to compete with, with capitalist platforms, that at least up to now that the main model is built on, on VC investment. So injection of very, very large amount of capital with the idea of um, becoming monopolistic platforms that, that take over a, a, a whole market. So we obviously can't compete uh, with that type of funding, but also it's not, it, it's completely incompatible with the, with the cooperative model. However, the cooperative model has a really inspiring and a, appropriate form of, of raising finance, which is community shares. I won't go into the details of community shares because it can get quite technical, but it, it, it's basically the idea that, that you're, crowdsourcing equity from your community and with conditions that are really fa favorable to um, companies that need or uh, cooperatives that need patient capital. And I'm happy to answer more questions on that if, if anyone has some specific questions. Um, and just to give you an idea, we're seeing um, platform co-ops raise between 400 and 600,000 pounds through community shares. So this is really, really, able to compete with um, what uh, traditional capitalist platforms are raising in, in angel investment. Um, so it's a really interesting area, but we're still exploring it. And um, so it's a new area for, for cooperatives that are not asset based uh, to be entering. So we'll, we'll see how that develops in the next years. We're particularly interested in attracting match funding to community shares. So attracting grant funding that can match what we raise from the community. Um, so we hope to see more developments in this area too. Um, a big problem is also the lack of resources and time of the people that want to set up the, the, the co-ops because very often they come from a, from a place of need and I'm sure some of the founders on this call <laughs> will resonate with them. Um, and so there's a great need of resources to support people at the very, very early stages of setting up uh, the cooperative. And so that's really about um, grant grant funding, basic grant funding to cover some basic costs and basic salaries. Um, so competition is a massive 
challenge. It's a massive challenge generally in the platform space. If you read any you know, blogs or anything about platforms, it's a constant competing with, with other platforms and it's very much driven by VC funding. The ones that get more VC funding just either buy up the other platforms or just make it impossible for them to operate. So my, my approach to this is that I don't think we should be competing on the same <laughs> on the same level, but it's really about competing. So competing, for example, on price is basically impossible uh, because uh, of the, the type of finance that they receive. But we can really compete on quality, on the offer, on the, the fact that we're offering ethical uh, alternatives to these platforms. Um, and I think there's so much, so much we can do um, with that. Um, and yeah, the platforms that I'm seeing emerge are really all talking about the quality of what they want to provide. Um, so that's really, really inspiring. Um, and finally, regulation. Um, we definitely need more regulation to curtail the power of big tech and the extent that they're taking over so much of our lives and definitely interventions like, for example, the Greater London Authority uh, banning Uber for certain periods of time because has has help can help or in Barcelona, I think they banned Airbnb uh, for a certain moment of, of time. I don't know if that's still the case. Um, so by banning them, we allow other uh, types of platforms to emerge that do respect quality of services uh, and uh, workers' rights and so on. Um, but we also really need support, direct support for emerging uh, and ethical businesses. So not only against the big tech, but whatever we do in, against big tech has to really, really support um, the new emergent ethical, ethical businesses. And that goes from uh, procurement, so that's you know really interesting to be talking here as part of this event, uh, but also providing uh, grant funding um, and finance uh, and business support. That is all I have to say, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions, uh, but also I think it would be really interesting to hear from the, the founders that we have on this call from their you know, lived experience. Thank you very much, Vika. Uh, shall we, I think there was one question in the chat, but could I suggest we perhaps pick that up a little later on? Because um, as you say, we do want to hear from the speakers and then just keep that one in mind perhaps to pick up at the end. Okay, so I'd like then to introduce Jen from Signalize. Thank you, Jen. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I have prepared a small presentation and I'll just get that ready now. I'm just gonna do it this way because I know I've had issues before losing my mouse. Right. So hello, I'm from Signalize Co-op and we are revolutionising British Sign Language Interpreting Services for all users. So we are setting up a platform to benefit anybody who basically needs to communicate with deaf people and who needs to book British Sign Language Interpreters. So that's what we're set up to do. We are a multi-stakeholder cooperative, which means we have a membership of user members, that's people from the deaf community, who use uh, sign language interpreters and other communication professionals for deaf people. And on the worker side, we have the interpreters and other communication professionals, such as lip speakers, note takers, and so forth. Um, so our background as a cooperative with around about 2009, there were, well, everyone's aware of the austerity drive in the UK, where after the um, financial ben, crap, yes. Just, sorry, the, the screen is blank. It, I don't oh, know. Can you not see anything? No. Sorry oh, to interrupt. Sorry. But... That's all right. No, thank you for interrupting. Let me try again. 
If not, I could just talk as if. Can you see that now? I can't see. I just see a black screen at the moment. Ah, okay. In that case, I'll just. I won't share. I'll just. Um, it could be something to do with the Zoom update. In that case, I'll just talk to my slides instead of showing them. But um, thank you for that. So yeah, in around 2009, we, after the financial crash, um, and then everyone's aware of the austerity drive, the contracting for the public sector for interpreting got more and more centralised. So rather than small contracts that were held locally by organisations, the contracts themselves got larger and larger. And in the Northwest, there was something called the Northwest Hub. And uh, the people that won that contract, the initial contracts were Capita and services rapidly went downhill. And after that, we saw an, an MOJ, Ministry of Justice um, contract that was very large, that went national. And that was the kind of start of the sort of uber privatization, if you like, of sign language interpreting services, which caused a lot of problems for workers, interpreters, and a lot of problems for users as well. On the back of that, um, the union was set up by one of my colleagues, um, Nikki Evans, so the National Union of BSL Interpreters. Um, and we were doing a lot of research into the contracts and one of the very first things that we had to do after we set up was um, basically campaign against a contract that wanted level two BSL, which is the equivalent of knowing holiday French, if you like. And it was, a, it was clear that these contracts had been drawn up from a place of little knowledge. Um, so we campaigned as a union uh, to basically scrap the framework was the name of the campaign. Um, since then, there's been many reports from the deaf community, from the British um, Deaf Association as well. And Nubsley also more recently had a dossier of disgrace, uh, which basically collated all the evidence of these poorly managed contracts. And a lot of these agencies, such as Capita um, and some of the other ones, who are very proficient at getting contracts, but not necessarily experts in sign language interpreting or the deaf community, were basically snapping up a lot of these contracts. Um, and it became clear after a few years of union work that we needed a legal entity to be able to bid for contracts and go into direct competition with these larger spoken language agencies. And that's how the basically the co-op was born. And because there were such problems in the Northwest, that was where um, we decided to start. And we now have a membership of, oh, about 75 people about 15 um, deaf community user members and 50 interpreters. So we're increasing quite rapidly. Um, it's a shame you can't see my screen because I was going to share um, just the headline of an article. This happened in February. It's an incredibly sad story. Um, and the headline is, daughter had to tell her deaf father he was dying as hospital couldn't get a sign language interpreter. And the reason I wanted to share this um, story is this is something that happens at least every year that there's a contract failure and the the man in question was um, terminally ill and his daughter had to tell her father that he only had two weeks um, to live and this continually happens we find that um, family members of the deaf community have to get involved in interpreting because there's been a failing by the hospital or by the agency that's got the contract. So in that particular case, it sounded like a communication breakdown as the hospital was saying that they did have a contract, but sometimes it can be that the staff aren't aware of who holds the contract. Or there is a contract, but interpreters won't work for the agency because they're not sustainable fees. And there's been boycotts in the past by the union of certain agencies that have put in for a tender at unreasonable prices without consulting interpreters as to whether they'd work for those prices. And there's this history of agencies promising the earth but being unable to deliver. And with a lack of monitoring, um, can often end up with a contract for four years, leaving the local deaf community without appropriate provision. 
quite often as well users report that there's no communication with the agency in question so they're on the way to the hospital and they don't even know if an interpreter has been booked because what happens is the agencies operate as middlemen in the middle and there's no communication between the interpreter and the deaf user, the interpreter and the hospital. It's all via the, the middleman, the agency in the middle, and then things start to go wrong, double bookings, cancellations. Deaf people don't know if there's an interpreter, but it's not an efficient system. Um, I had a quote from Equal Care Co-op, who we very much following in their footsteps. They were one of the pioneers of the platform co-op movement in the UK. And this is a quote from them. Um, just saying power in the hands of those who matter the most, the people who give and receive care and support. So we're basically following in their footsteps by saying that we're the experts as people that have provided interpreters for many years and people who know how to run a booking service for interpreting, that we can do this a lot better. And we can, and the reason we can do it a lot better is because we've got the co-op structure behind us, as well as um, the tech, which brings us to the digitalization. So with the tech, what that gives us is a more sustainable business model. We have lower overheads because we have more automation. We have a leaner business model. Because we have more automation, we have less administration fees and we can pay better and also compete on price. I know Vika mentioned price earlier. It's not easy we can't compete with all of the agencies out there because they do undercut in various and have various let's just say poor working practices um but we hope that in the future that interpreters will vote with their feet and come to work for the co-op rather than anyone else because they'll get sustainable fees and an input into the business shared ownership and democratic um decision making so we have the tech on one side supported by the cooperative um, model of governance that enables us to, we see it thrive as a community um, offering a service. We also, off, we also use sociocracy um, for our democratic decision-making. Um, I just wanted to mention that because we've, we've already seen some really powerful examples of basically deaf people in meetings saying, like, I've never been able to talk about the lack of provision that I've had in such a way where I know that people are listening to, listening to me and things might actually change. Like we know that um, some NHS organisations and councils have had consultations. I'm sure you've heard of the word non-saltation where it feels that you're constantly being consulted, but nothing actually ever happens. It, they're sort of tokenistic consultations and that's one thing that we want to avoid that's one thing by our um, governance structure that by bringing users in we're actually one of the first people in the country well we are the first people in the country that where deaf people's deaf people are co-owners of the business and co-run the service which has never happened before other businesses might have advisory boards or um, one or two deaf people owning the company, but it's never happened before that the whole of a community have this opportunity to become part owners in a business and doing it alongside interpreters as well. And we've had the equivalent light bulb moments in, in workers meetings where um, people just constantly use words like cathartic, where inter interpreters are saying, you know, I've never had the opportunity to talk in this way and resolve issues in this way collectively and together. Sometimes being a freelance interpreter can be quite lonely. You're working. A lot of people decide to work freelance because of the flexibility and control over their work. And what we're trying to do is offer that flexibility and control, but within a supportive environment that's a collective where people can come together and feel much more supported than they do um, out in their own working. Um, I was also just going to talk about what the platform actually does. So we're in the last stages of testing the platform. Um, we want it to be better, safer, quicker and more cost effective. So better because it's more automated and easier to see what's happening in the process of um, booking an interpreter. So it's more transparent for the, the user that's actually trying to book an interpreter. 
safer because we monitor our interpreter registrations. We automate the process of checking them, such as checking their DBS checks and uh, their police checks and when they're expired and whether their registrations lapsed. We want the whole process to be quicker rather than going through um, an agency middleman coming and then finding out whether you've got someone booked or not. This is all done so that the user takes control of their own bookings and more cost effective. So again, lower admin fees means sustainable fees for the interpreter as well as um, being able to be cost effective and competitive. Um, and what this can do, our predominant target for business at the moment is the public sector because we think that's where the social impact is the, the greatest um, because the contracts are so can be so shocking. Some of the I mean, the news stories that come out about, um, especially for spoken language interpreters, but it's quite often the same agencies that hold the contracts um, and the interpreters that were supposed to be professional have um, been um, fined for fraud and all sorts when they weren't actually interpreting properly. Um, and, and also in police cases where cases have had to have been thrown out of court when they get to court because the, the um, interpreting that was done at the police station wasn't good enough. So there's all sorts of problems in the spoken language sector um, as well. And obviously we're not here to for the spoken language sector. There is another co-op being set up for spoken language and we're very much in contact with them. And hopefully they will we'll be able to bid together for certain contracts in future. Um, so what next for Signalize? We will be launching the platform in its MVP phase, so minimal viable products, and then um, iterating on that in the future with um, more features and especially looking at the back end. So rather than the front end that users see, how we can actually use data effectively for our own um, use and also for commissioners, benefiting commissioners in the way that we collect data, automate it, saving us on admin time when it comes to monthly reporting and stats, when it comes to auditing, um, and also potentially the use of shared data. So cleaning up the data, anonymizing it, and then being able to share it for the community goods. We're really interested in that at the moment as well. So we're working with um, a data analyst and a data scientist, which is really exciting. We also have live a community share offer. Um, it's a shame you can't see the link, but I shall put it in the chat in a minute. So if anyone's interested in finding out more about community shares and also investing and becoming an investor member, I can tell you now, plug alert, that the Signalize offer is incredibly good. So you'll get 5% interest and it currently attracts tax relief of 30%. So if you're looking to save on your tax bill or you have a large community gains bill coming up, then you can offset it with an investment into Signalize. And we're currently at, I think it's 205,000 pounds that we're um, at at the moment. It runs for about another 20 days. We may extend if necessary. Um, we're aiming for a 300 maximum because we realize we're quite niche and not everybody perhaps is interested in deaf people or sign language interpreting. So we just went for a 300 maximum, um, but we would absolutely love to smash that target and we'd love to welcome more investor members. So if you have 50 pounds to spare or more, then um, please take a look that I'll look at the link that I'll pop in the chat later. Um, and also if I would encourage you to, to use our service as well, so you can um, book interpreters like Sam um, for any live events, webinars, um, or face-to-face -face booking as the world's reopening now after COVID. And I shall also pop um, that link in the chat as well. So I haven't been watching the chat. Um, just see if there's any questions come through. So that's the end of my presentation. Yeah, I'll share the slides afterwards. Do you want me, Rachel, to start answering questions? Yes, we have one question from Hera. Hi, Hera. And Zola, I think, was interested in the response. They're wondering about the possibility of franchising your approach. Yeah, absolutely. We're, de <laughs> We're definitely interested in talking to people that might be interested in the platform as well. Um, our main efforts at the moment are concentrating on um, the UK and getting it launched in the UK, getting interpreters signed up to the platform, not just our 
worker members, but um, we know that a lot of the community outside our membership in the Northwest are excited too. But that yes, after that, we would be very interested in seeing what the potential is for working with others and potentially franchising it. It would be very easy to replicate what we're doing for the sign language interpreting profession elsewhere in the world, but also spoken language and, and potentially other areas as well. And I'd be, I'd be very happy to have a chat with anyone about that. Okay, another couple of questions. How similar is British Sign Language to American Sign Language? Oh, so there's a there's usually a sign language for every country. Um, and American is quite different. So due to historical links of the way deaf people have traveled, there are quite a, there's a quite a large similarity between Australian Sign Language and British Sign Language. Um, but American is quite different. Okay, just one quick final question from Debbie. She says, what geographical areas do you cover for face-to-face -face work? Um, at the moment, we're concentrating on the Northwest, but we do plan to um, expand. So we started off in Merseyside where the need was the greatest, but we find that we're getting approached by a lot of Lancashire interpreters as well. And because um, of the geographical spread and also the way that, you know, the deaf community is a diaspora, it's, spread geographically around the country obviously deaf people don't all live in the same place and also interpreters there's only about 1250 in the country so we're actually in short supply so we would um service face-to-face -face bookings say greater manchester north wales merseyside and lancashire predominantly merseyside but we can cover some of those areas as well we do actually have a, an increasing membership in Manchester from people that are in, interested in the platform and our work so um, if you're in any basically any part of the northwest we can probably cover it okay well thank you very much I think just one final well there are a couple of there are a couple, other couple of questions but I think we should probably move on um maybe you could you could respond to those in the chat yeah Jen, or indeed I think will people have your details so they put an email you if they want to get into a more detailed conversation about aspects of training etc yeah. well thank you very much that was that was really interesting and I think your 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 backstory how you came into being and the forming of the union and the fact that your model actually could replicate across quite a number of sectors which have become characterized by contracting and a very poor quality of contracting and outsourcing I think is, is, is really inspiring so thank you very much thank you all right I'd like now to hand over to Debbie to a completely different theme bicycles now so thank you Debbie okay I'm just going to share my screen hope it works that's just we can see I can see you Debbie yeah yeah can you see um right okay Okay. Ooh, we right. can see the screen too. That's what I can see it. So I think we're okay there. Great. Okay. So thanks so much for um, having me on your uh, panel. I've been so inspired by uh, the stories I've heard so far, and it is it, it's it, yeah, it's fantastic to to hear other things that are going on in the cooperative platform arena. Um. So my name's. Debbie and um, I'm a co-founder of Chalton Bike Deliveries. We um, are not a, um, a digital platform ourselves, but are a user of Co-op Cycle, um, a cooperative digital platform that I'll talk about in the presentation. Um, what we do at Chalton Bike Deliveries is offer car free deliveries to and for local residents, businesses and community organisations by a variety of bikes, trikes and trailers. And Chalton is an inner city area um, uh, of South Manchester. Um, our website's there and I can put it in the chat for you to have a, a look at more info about what we do. And Chalton is a very diverse area, um, but we, we really cover Chalton and its boundaries. So probably we're, we're covering about a five mile radius at the moment. So. Okay, just trying to work out how I can get to my next. There we go. So how we began. So we're actually brand new. We were 
born uh, in April 21 from a grassroots response to the COVID crisis. So um, it really came from a desire from to, to think about what can we do uh, to help our community at the beginning of the first lockdown. Um, we were all cyclists and selfishly, and we were all thinking, and how can I stay on my bike and still get out and about? But we all have a shared passion for active travel um, and climate change leading to reduced emissions and increasing well-being. We also thought about how can we support our local independent high street and five of us came together and thought, OK, let's uh, let's do this. Um, so in the very in the early days, we just um, sourced two cargo bikes. One was on loan from Transport for Greater Manchester and one was on low cost hire for Manchester Bike Hire. And we just quickly got on with creating a logo, a web page, a Facebook group, an email address and a phone. And off we went. Uh, we recruited a small pool of volunteer riders and uh, developed some protocols. And uh, we reached out to all our traders that were still open. Um, we also reached out to our local food charities and the COVID-19 streets group. Um, we responded to ad hoc requests for help whenever we could. There were people shielding, obviously, at that time. Um, we accessed support from our local co-op network and Co-ops UK. And um, uh, Vika mentioned before about the Hive. So we've um, had support through the Hive in setting up our governance to becoming a co-op, which has been fantastic. Uh, we obviously talked to others doing similar projects in other places to ourselves. And as part of that Googling around, we discovered uh, co the Co-op Cycle Federation. We knew nothing at all about digital platform economies. So we were really inspired and excited by uh, Co-op Cycle and were very excited to be part of a European federation just at the time of Brexit and we joined them in August 2020. So our purpose is um, to promote the use of bikes and enable people to use them for local journeys, enable our members to make their contribution to a greener Chorlton, so very much from uh, a, green, a green roots, but we also want to be able to raise sufficient income through our offer with traders and businesses to pay a living wage and fund our voluntary work and employing really particularly young people um, in the courier business with a decent hourly living wage, wage is one of our key aims as we move forward. So what are we actually doing now? So we, we have two arms, a community and commercial arm. Um, being rooted in the COVID crisis, the community arm um was at was really our starting point and now we we still do daily pickups uh, of surplus food to food banks and food clubs all very local um, we support a couple of organizations with their weekly distribution of free meals to vulnerable people and vulnerable groups and we've been involved in a lot of one-off um, community projects Wednesdays and Fridays are our local traded deliveries to residents. What we've done is try to funnel our deliveries because to try and make it worthwhile to actually pay riders an hourly living wage. But we do do ad hoc deliveries um, on other days. And very recently, we have secured um, a, an NHS contract, which is really exciting. So twice a day, we are picking up blood samples from our local GP surgeries and cycling over to our local hospital. Um, and um, that, that has definitely been a very exciting development. We're trying to develop our business to business um, work. Um, already we, we're supplying bread to one of our local grocery cooperatives in Chorlton. But this is those two areas really are where we see 
um, our business growing as, as uh, we open up post COVID. So what, what did we achieve over our first year? Well, we've now managed to raise funds to buy an e-cargo bike and an e-cargo trike and a customized trailer. Um, we've built trusted partnerships with 13 local independent traders and community groups. We now have a pool of over 20 active riders to support both our voluntary and paid work. We have our NHS contract. We have some great visibility on the streets, on the, both locally and on social media. Um, and we are very much a part of a network of other bike delivery um, organisations. We are aligned with local climate change activities, walking and cycling campaigns, and actions against food poverty. And literally just this week on Monday, uh, we formally launched our multi-stakeholder cooperative. And we now have 54 members uh, drawn from riders, traders and community. And throughout this time, we've been an active member of Co-op Cycle, developing our use of the platform and where we can also support newer cycle co-ops. So um, York Collective are um, a cycling co-op obviously in York and they have been really supportive of us. And then as newer um, co-ops emerge, there's one uh, in Chester that has recently started and they got in contact with us for chats about how, you know, the, how, to, uh, how to set up. Um, so it's a very supportive community. So just to say a little bit about Co-op Cycle. Um, so these are a few of their slides that I'm sharing with you. And they're a network of uh, local worker-owned bike delivery co-ops. And they are very much strengthened through the power of collectivity. And they're, if you wanted to have a little look at more information about them, their website de details are there and I can also um, Put those on the chat. Co-op Cycle started in uh, 2017 um, where a small group of rider activists um, in France created a union and basically they were you know fed up of being ripped off by the gig economy and wanted an alternative model to the extractive commercial platforms of Uber Eats and Deliveroo and the like. And now there's a network of 70 local co-ops internationally. Most are in Europe. Um, the biggest ones are in France and Germany, um, but they are, they're growing all the time. So Co-op Cycle, it, being a member of Co-op Cycle, it is more than a collective digital platform. It's a federation to pool resources and expertise. So supporting new co-ops, sharing experiences, they can come together for bulk purchases, for advice around management of contracts and wages. So how does co-op cycle work? Well, it starts off with um, a very democratic model, where in the decision-making process, each cooperative has one vote and the federation structure, I think is, is very similar to uh, the sociocracy model that um, Signalize have, have, have just spoken about. Um, there, it's very much based on working groups. There is a general assembly of all members and I think there's over 500 members now and they are the members of the individual co-ops um, and there are different groups, working groups, looking at all the different aspects of the uh, platform development. They have, I think, uh, now two employees, um, but the, the actual platform, digital platform itself has been very much driven by uh, Mex, who is the digital expert. Um, I'm very lucky to have a cycle enthusiast who also has that software um, expertise. So yes, now they have two salaried, salaried workers, they're made up of the co-op members and um, 15 volunteers. 
So how do we communicate? So um, there is a, a Slack where all the issues that you might have, everything from day-to-day -day glitches with the platform, help, I can't do this, or this has gone wrong, to uh, development ideas, to sharing news stories, um, all goes through the Slack. So you really feel part of an ongoing development process. And I am not a tech person at all myself. However, um, you know, the support that you get from the tech guys, and it's not just a one-way process between you and the platform, you and Co-op Cycle, you, you'll put a query on a, a, how you can't manage something on the platform or can it do this or do that for your co-op and you'll get responses from people from also all, a whole range of co-ops to uh, support you. It's a very, very supportive place. Lumio is what they use for decision making. Um, they recently had a number of votes that um, um, came out of their annual general meeting and there was a very, it was most digital demo well I've never done a digital democracy before but it really does offer a very transparent and very democratic way of um, making decisions and in uh, they also have an annual general meeting where um, people come together and, and decisions are made in real life rather than COVID life. So how, how um, has Co-op Cycle helped set up and grow our commercial arm? Um, we could not have done this without Co-op Cycle. And um, it has been absolutely integral to us that we work with a platform that shares our cooperative values. And being part of an international community connecting to other Cycle Courier Co-ops has been really important, that sense of, of community and of growing together absolutely fundamentally it's given us access to a digital platform that we don't have the tech knowledge or the financial resources to any extent at all to be able to create ourselves um, and be able to afford it. Um, it's also given our traders access to that platform as well because we work with local independent traders um, where um, you know, that, that sense of support has been really important. It's enabled us to pay, our, which is really, and that's what has enabled us to pay our riders a living wage for our commercial work. You know, if these platforms were taking a 30% cut, there's no way we could have uh, competed in, in any way. Um, it's created a tr trusted professional workflow for traders. So when the traders come to talk to us about um, what we can do with them, you know, the, the fact that we can set them up on our platform, get them to have a look at it, rather than, you know, what we did right at the beginning was emails and texts and, you know, Excel spreadsheets. This gives a real consistent, trusted workflow and a way that orders can be traced and, and so on. So it also, Co-op Cycle, there is, it provides an app with all the information and maps for our riders. It's, um, it works extremely well for the riders on the app. It's very similar to, um, I did a little stint with Deliveroo before all of this, and it, it does work very similarly to a, a Deliveroo app. Um, it also, the Co-op Cycle platform can offer a shop front for independent traders um, who don't have their e-commerce, own e-commerce, and we've got a couple of those um, working with us. And it just provides capacity for growth into all sorts of different areas. Okay, uh, why isn't that moving along? Um, okay, so, oops, sorry. Ooh, I've just gone too far now. Okay. Okay, so moving ahead, um, we're looking to expand our service across South Manchester. We want to pay for more rider hours and secure more public sector delivery contracts. 
We've just started talks with our local authority about library books for people who are housebound. Um, we're looking at a crowdfunder for another bike. And we're also starting to look at where we can um, host our actual bikes um, in a kind of community hub uh, premises. Uh, we currently use a couple of our um, founding members back backyards and locked up garages for the bikes. So, um, which really isn't sustainable and, you know, for further growth, that's what we need. But really lying behind all of this is our membership of the co-op cycle platform. Um, we haven't moved into the takeaway business, which is what the platform is mostly set up to do at the moment. We had a little, little flutter with one of our trade, one of our key traders, and it really is a very complicated, difficult thing. Um, trying to compete with Deliveroo or Uber Eats in the mainstream market isn't what we're going to be doing. It is about supporting independent uh, traders and independent food outlets. And success really for us is being part of that community, part of the digital platform community and part of our local community. Um, with a couple of quotes here, it feels good to be part of an organisation that's making a difference in the community from one of our riders. And Chalton Bike Deliveries has been essential to our startup. We look forward to keeping bikes at the heart of how we work. So that's it from me. Um, thank you for listening and I'll share some of those links um, in the chat. I'll stop sharing there. Okay. Thank you very much, Debbie. Um, I'm going to jump in with a question, <laughs> but I think there may, uh, and then you may be able to pick some up in the, in the chat after. We know that in this country, a lot of cities are moving towards clean air zones, basically keeping motorised traffic out of the centre of cities. Bristol, Oxford, I think some of the Birmingham, some of the Birmingham area, there are quite a few. Are you seeing an interest in but in, in the kind of service that you've set up in those areas or, or in, indeed do you see any way of seeding your idea in those cities so so local groups local cycling activists are encouraged to do what you've done yeah so in manchester um there we are very much in touch with what's going on locally with um last with the last mile provision um last mile and, and there are we we are um there are a couple of other cycle courier companies that are much bigger than ourselves that are involved in that last mile um competing in that arena we are not ready yet in terms of the size that we are we're more interested at the moment in what's called only mile <laughs> so we have a direct business to business relationship rather than picking up at the end of of a whole trail of, of of deliveries in terms of reaching beyond our area i think for us being local and community based and our networks has been what has made us a success and what i'd like to see is to support other areas to support them to set up bristol cycle deliveries or urmston cycle deliveries rather than us expand, we're not looking to franchise out or expand ourselves, but to support those other, support those other networks. Oh, you're on mute, Rachel. You're still on mute. There you are. Yeah, sorry, I I've, I've, I've tried to do two things there because we just need to check that um, Lynn is still on on the call but thank you yeah that is really interesting i i think the, the the way that different policies can intersect is is um is, is quite exciting isn't it so so the move towards clean air zones mm -hmm. and then of course active travel and and cooperative development yeah i mean uh, the five of us um came out of a really walk ride chalton which came out of sort of walk ride manchester which is the whole campaign around cleaner air and looking at making the streets much more pedestrian and cycle friendly. So really that, that was 
our roots and where our interest in this came. Right, thank you. Right, I think we've got Lynn back. <laughs> Thanks, Jess. So let's just before we, we ask Lynn to join us, have we got any more questions in the chat? Should we just have a quick look back there? No, I think I think that's it. So I'd just like to thank you very much, Debbie. That was really interesting because we got a real sense both of your business and how you came into being, but also how the tech, how, how Co-op Cycle has really made the difference. And that I think is very exciting for any, I, I do believe there are some people in the Preston area who are looking at this as a project. So if you're out there, if you've been listening, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, Debbie would be, be willing to talk to you. So thank you very much. So our last speaker this afternoon is Lynn Davis from the Open Food Network. Lynn. Hello. Um, can you hear me? You're very faint. Okay, let's see if we can improve this. Basically, I'm so sorry. What's happened is my internet has completely gone down and I've now connected through my phone. Uh, <laughs> so I'm hoping that we can try and do this. I even had some slides to share and everything, uh, which I have actually read just emailed to you. So if you happen to get that email, <laughs> you might be able to access my slides and share them on my behalf. Um, but right now it is Zoom on my phone. So does this work? Can you hear me if I talk like this? We can hear you, yes. Okay. Excellent. Um, so yeah, my apologies. Um, and Rachel, if those slides do come through, then please feel free to share them and we can coordinate getting the right slide in the right place. Otherwise, I'm going to have to play the game of just presenting from my slides without you getting to see them, which I'm very sorry about. Um, okay, um, I've got your slides. Um, this is such an excellent tech win. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to work out how I can, how I can share them now. Oh. Right, you carry on and I'll see what I can do. I will, yeah, okay, great. Um, and where, if you get to the point of sharing, then we can just coordinate which slides you go to. Um, but yeah, so uh, apologies for the tech fail here, but I'm Lynn, I'm from the Open Food Network, uh, and we are a platform cooperative that enable community-led food systems. So we essentially, as Vicky said at the start, we aim to be a uh, infrastructure to provide software that helps community-led food systems to thrive. And we do this uh, in the interest of building a kind of food sovereignty, so like a direct control and ownership over our home food system, how our food systems work and putting that control into the eaters and the producers and the workers in between, the most important people in our food system. Um, and uh, just gonna move the phone, sorry. Um, yeah, so our kind of vision uh, and if you are on the slides at all, then that's the, let's move to the next slide. <laughs> um, our vision is uh, to move from this kind of world of global uniformity into a world of diversity. Um, and so uh, to us, this is kind of really central to the mission that we need to be on in the 21st century. You know, I think um, if, uh, lots of us will kind of have images in our mind or uh, on slides um, <laughs> about, uh, you know, huge uh, massive scale tractors over kind of arid landscapes plowing up fields and comparing that to maybe a, a vibrant vision of uh, forests and trees and diverse crops uh, in kind of growing between each other with a lot of space for wildlife and biodiversity as well as human crops and you know so that's kind of on the, on the field scale but also when you think about the business scale we have a similar Oh, look at this, screen sharing, excellent. Um, so on the business scale, we have a similar uh, issue where we have, say, you know, massive monopoly scale companies uh, with, you know, huge packing and distribution that doesn't have, so yeah, the slide before that one, um, you know, where the workers don't necessarily have much control over, over the way that the, the company is led. And we end up with these very streamlined, very efficient 
the very cold and dry businesses um, that really don't give any empowerment or a sense of vibrancy to our local economies. And so when we talk about diversity, we need it everywhere. We need it across our landscapes, through our communities, throughout our economy, throughout representation. Um, and so this is what we aim to do as the Open Food Network. And so to the next slide, basically, you know, if we want to have diverse agroecological food production, then we need to have diverse routes to market. Those kind of farming systems they have, they will have smaller, more regular harvests of a much greater variety of crops. Uh, if we want to have diverse businesses, then they require diverse business models where loads of people feel uh, inspired and like they uh, empowered to kind of create businesses that genuinely serve their communities. And our food system is full of businesses like this. Um, they tend to be, you know, they're not at the scale of the Tesco's and the, you know, the massive dominating actors within uh, uh, food retail, but they play a really important role. Uh, businesses like food hubs or veg box schemes, local food deliveries, buying groups, uh, people who are doing kind of aggregation or producer collectives, farmers markets, click and collect schemes on a small scale. Um, so, yeah, the, and these kind of businesses, they, uh, they actually really proved their fundamental importance during COVID, you know, like across the sector businesses were growing by 900, a thousand percent overnight when supermarkets weren't delivering, uh, they couldn't take any more online orders, uh, food, you know, community led food enterprises were supplying every order and they, they had those local links with producers, with their community so that they could bring up people who were shielding and make sure that they got food or they could, uh, you know, they knew which producers used to supply pubs and were now looking for routes to market. So, these businesses, you know, not only they, they've proven to be much more resilient, not only are they more resilient from an ecological perspective, but they're really resilient in terms of crisis when shocks happen. These are the businesses that can really support communities. And so this is the infrastructure um, that we want to build up, a kind of a world where we're fed by these kind of food enterprises that are well networked, that coordinate with each other, that can effectively share the appropriate data so that we can uh, find the efficiencies where they need to exist, say in logistics, but we can put that control in the hands of the producers and the communities uh, where it belongs. Um, so that's a bit about what we're about. And we think about what we do on a perspective of subsidiarity. So where it, where it is the most appropriate kind of point of governance or coordination, organizing at the most local scale possible. And so sometimes that most local scale is, you know, the, the land beneath your feet, the farm that is growing that carrot. Sometimes it's a regional area where you're coordinating the producers to create a regional distribution scheme. Sometimes when it comes to the software, it's actually on a global scale. Um, so, because so, you know, there's lots of reasons to try and pool resources and the more that we bring other countries and people and you know from around the world within to the, the open food network global community the more we realize that the problems are the same everywhere and the solutions are very similar and by pooling our resources we can come up with these kind of the shared global commons which benefits everyone so to the next slide uh, this is an example. So we, we work with food hubs across the country. We work with thousands of producers across the country uh, and tens of thousands of shoppers um, and uh, all kind of creating these, these bespoke and really local, really fitted to context uh, food enterprises. So the larder is a beautiful example and where we've been kind of in conversations for years and very excited about working together more closely in the coming years. Um, to, and so the LADA, maybe many of you know about it, and I'm not sure whether Kay was able to join this call, but hopefully she's about, uh, but it's a fantastic social enterprise combining cafe with training and food sales, and they're using the open food network to kind of add more flexibility to their model for retail and wholesale, um, and doing things like providing flexible pricing and voucher systems and being able to better support folks on low incomes so that we can address food poverty in a dignified and empowering way. Um, so if we go to the next slide, 
Um, I better do that on my screen because it's not going to happen for me. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, by bringing together producers across the country and the world to, that are organizing in these community food hubs, we can share ideas, skills, knowledge, and pool resources around the world to create a global commons as we design for a more diverse food system. And this is what we're all about. And it's fascinating to see that, you know, when we started, we were like, okay, software. Yeah, we want to we wanna make software that's shared. Um, and now we really realize that sharing ideas, skills, and knowledge is just even more important than building the tools themselves. And, you know, COVID in the first lockdown, uh, we were organizing webinars with Beijing Farmers Market and, you know, farmers in Italy to try and coordinate and understand how we should respond to this as a collective of community food enterprises in the UK. And this was before government even announced lockdown, you know, like this was at a time when there was just absolutely, everyone was panicking, and I, you know, I'm sure we all remember it, but there was no guidance for food enterprises. These food enterprises were growing really fast as more and more people were ordering from them and they had no guidance whatsoever. So we were able to work with the global community to pull those ideas and knowledge as well, which is an incredibly powerful thing. Uh, to the next slide. Uh, so, uh, yeah. What we do, it's not just, we do build a software platform. It's an integral part of what we do, making these tools that are all about creating, uh, you know, reducing the admin overhead, trying to make it more simple and effective to run these kind of community scale food enterprises, because the most important work happens at the community scale, you know, with the people, with the farmers. Um, and uh, so the software is intended to try and take some of the boring admin side simplify that as much as possible so that there's more uh you know the very low margins that exist in food anything from that can pay fair living wages and can go into you know putting that community work first uh, but we also you know we also understand that community food enterprises are it's not a straightforward thing to do it's an incredibly difficult thing to do particularly in this current world where food is just so unfathomably cheap um, so we also do a lot in terms of uh, sharing resources, we have a learning community, uh, and also figuring out how to best contribute to research and contribute the data that we're able to build uh, and organize um, into so that we can make a stronger case for these kind of food enterprises and feed that into different kind of research work that's happening. Um, so to the next slide. Um, a little bit about our journey. So we've always been built by people who are farmers or running community food enterprises themselves in the UK. I mean, my own journey to this was being a farmer, training as a farmer and realizing as we lost one of our main market for our produce that we then needed to find a new market and there was just no option. We had no option to route to market. So we developed this kind of, there were a number of farmers that lost their market at the same time. So we came together to build a community food hub and then realized that, uh, you know, it was a great model, but it needed software to make this happen. And this software, it was kind of an online farmer's market and the software was, we couldn't fund the development of the software ourselves. So we linked with other groups across the UK who were trying to do the same thing. Uh, and in particular, a group in Stroud, uh, Stroud Co, Tamar Valley Food Hub, Fife Diet were also part of the initial conversations. Um, and we uh, kind of started the journey of trying to build a collaborative software and found that there was a group in Australia called the Open Food Network who were a few months ahead of us in software development. So we joined resources and joined, joined in with them to try and make this an international project. And it has grown from there with groups in France joining next, a group in Catalonia uh, joining next. And so the Spanish uh, contingent started uh, um, and it's rippled up from there over the years. So um, it's been quite a kind of grassroots and exciting journey, but we've learned a lot of things on this journey. Uh, one thing that we've really learned is about uh, the, that in the long term, like building something quick and cheap as a software tool you can do that, you can just whip something together, but actually it's really important to be thinking long-term every step of the journey. And we definitely made this mistake, kind of going for new features and not taking care of the underlying infrastructure, the technical debt, we call it, 
um, that supports it. And because the internet changes and moves so quickly, you know, new phones come out, new tools are happening, new viruses are detected. You've always got to be keeping up with the groundwork so that your software doesn't become out of date. And it's expensive to do that. It's very tempting to cut corners, but you pay in the long run. And um, that's definitely, I think it's, it's hard to understand how expensive software is to build in this way in this world that we live in where you know most software is just delivered to us for free or so cheaply um as others sell our data for capitalist gain um and yeah building software with social aims it's quite difficult to fund that particularly in low margin areas or where you're trying to prioritize paying fair wages and things like this um, and as I was referring to earlier, like COVID really showed how vital this digital infrastructure can be. Um, and, but, you know, as we've seen in COVID, Amazon have been one of the big winners here. And I think society as a whole loses because of that. So this is why putting this cooperative infrastructure into our hands is just so important. To the next slide, um, just a little bit here on the power of data. So the image in the background is this kind of mycelial network that you might be familiar with. Um, and this is really how we see the work that we do, trying to kind of become this mycelial interconnected web um, infrastructure that is self-organizing and playing a supportive role to the world around us. Um, so, you know, we, we're always going to be open source. This is really important to how we operate. Um, and yeah, we're re you know, data is a commodity now more valuable than oil to the global economy. And in food and farming, it's in encroaching fast, you know, the big tax role in food and farming. Um, so we're really, to us, it's really important to understand how we can use this data for the common good, how we can use this data to build, to, to achieve scale where it's appropriate to do so, but to make sure the power stays with trusted people. So you, concepts like data trusts, these are kind of, Concepts that are worth looking into more, but I don't have time to explain here, but I just maybe a little teaser if you're interested in this kind of thing. Um, and uh, also open, open interoperability standards, because, you know, as we grow as a platform, we realize that being the one platform to rule them all is not what we want to do. It's not our goal. We don't want to be the Amazon of food, the food sector. So how do we enable a diverse economy of platforms? as well that can interoperate, but you know, don't have to then have delivery trucks driving past each other because it's incredibly wasteful um, to, to not be at scale in logistics. But if you, have, if you have to be at scale to get that efficiency, then I think we lose uh, as a society uh, because we lose the diversity from what we do. So yeah, we're exploring ways to do that through open interoperability standards and through working out how logistics can be coordinated and the Southwest Good Food Network is an incredible example of that, um, coordinating their logistics services across different food hubs and box schemes around the Southwest um, and doing so in a way which is, uh, you know, maintains the local control to those community food enterprises, but expands the, the market for produce where it's appropriate to do so. So another really good example to check out if you're interested. Um, but that is probably enough from me. Thank you for bearing with me in this tech, what feels like from my end, a technical disaster, but hopefully it didn't seem too much like it from your end. Um, and I won't be able to see the chat for questions. So please do say them out loud for me. That's all right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Lynn. I don't think it was a technological disaster. It took me a while <laughs> to get my head around it, but um, so I'm sorry about that if, if uh, I was a bit slow with these slides. Oh, no, thank you so much for, for playing along. I'm so glad that worked out because it, um, yeah, it would have been worse without the slides. So yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, just I'm just having a quick look through the, through the chat. There aren't any specific questions I can see. But Zolo in Mongolia is, I think, very, very keen to get the presentation because mm. he did express it. The, he was he was with us or she was with us last week and expressed real interest in this area. Um, so oh, we've got a question from Jennifer Damashek, who's in the US. She says, do you have a presence in the US? We do have a presence in the US. Yeah. Um... So if you go to openfreenetwork.org, then you'll be able to find a link from there to all the different instances across the world. And there is 
what, there is a presence in the US that uh, I should know what it is off the top of, off the top of my head because everyone is like openfood.org.uk.org.au. The US is not that one though; it's something else. But we definitely exist there, so I'm sure you could find it easily enough. Um, and I can see someone in Mongolia. I'm now getting chat pop-ups on my phone. This is great. Um, so yeah, uh, similarly from the like the openfoodnetwork.org is our global site, um, and from there it, there's more information about how to start something like this in your local area. So you could definitely we uh, and we have a fantastic global community. We organize on Slack, which is not a platform cooperative, but we'd love to be <laughs> organizing on more web tools that do so. So um, yeah, we can welcome you into our Slack community and give you all the information about how to get started launching an instance in Mongolia, if that's something that you'd like to do. Very much do get in touch. Okay, well, well, thank you very much, Lynn. We've got lots of thanks coming up in the in the chat. You'll see that there. And yeah. thanks for oh, yeah. thank you to Vika for sharing the US one. Um, there we are. She shared it for you. So that's 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 great. Well, we're nearly on time. So I'd like to first thank today's speakers very much for their inspiring contributions. I think it's it's been a, a really interesting session. We've covered three very different sectors of the economy, but I think demonstrated in all of them, the power of both cooperatives and the power of digital ownership of digital platforms. So if any of you are inspired to, to take an idea you have for this further, there, there's plenty of information on the Cooperatives UK website about cooperatives. And also um, if you follow the links for Unfound, There'll be details about more, more information about platform cooperatives. And do remember at the beginning that Vika mentioned the, the accelerator program coming up at quite soon. So you've just, just missed the, the one that starts the next week or so, but there is another one in the early autumn, I believe. So do look at that. There are other support, there's other support, business support for cooperative development generally. The Cooperatives UK has the Hive, which I think one of our speakers mentioned. And then if you're living in the Preston, Chorley or South Ribble area, we do have a, uh, a support programme for worker startup cooperatives. If you'd like to find out more about that, um, we, I will put, oh, Alina has kindly put the, uh, she just put the email address in the chat. That provides up to 10 days of expert consultancy support to assist with the setup of a worker cooperative. So lots of ideas there for follow up. Um, do feedback to us your, your thoughts. Always interested to hear suggestions perhaps for future webinars. Very happy to look at those. So finally, once again, I'd really like to thank the speakers. Thank Vika, Lynn, Jen and Debbie. And also to thank Sam, who I think has worked the hardest of all this afternoon. So thank you very much, Sam. <laughs> And, and we've had a team promoting and, and doing the tech for this session. So I'd like to thank all of them as well. And finally, to thank you for coming along and participating. I think it's, as I said earlier, it's been a very interesting, very worthwhile session. So thank you all um, and every best wish in your future plans, especially if they're cooperative ones. Thank you very much. Bye bye.